Good afternoon, everybody, and welcome to Credit Chat. I'm Rod Griffin, Director of Consumer Education and Advocacy for Experian. Thanks for being here. We're here to talk about credit reports and credit scores and fraud and identity theft, all of those things that Experian has some expertise in and that I might be able to share information and in. hope you're all ready for the holidays. They're coming really fast. So thanks for being here. Thanks for joining. If you have any questions, please feel free to ask. That's what we're here to do is, is to answer your questions. If you have questions, I'm sure everybody else does as well. So please feel free to ask. Uh, I see I, I won, or I, I think I said that right. Thanks for joining, being part of the chat. I uh, hope everybody else is doing well. Um, it's a beautiful day in Texas, a little chilly. Uh, Glow Fleming, thanks for joining. Thanks for being part of the chat. Again, if you have questions, please feel free to ask. This is about having a dialogue and a conversation about understanding what you need to know about credit reports and credit scores and fraud and ID theft. Ms. ZD4, always great to see you. Uh, I'm sure you'll have good questions. You always do. Uh, and please join us for chats. I try to be here every Tuesday and Thursday. Fair warning, I won't be here this Thursday. I'm going to be traveling to visit my family, uh, so I won't be able to make it. Uh, but glad to be here today. And uh, Bulut2717, thanks for joining being part of the chat today. Uh, you know, it's we're going to have a Twitter chat tomorrow at 2 o'clock Central, 3 Eastern. We do every Wednesday talking about New Year's resolutions, so we're getting a little ahead of the year there. Uh, you may have seen, if, if you haven't, we just launched our annual state of credit survey. Uh, so it's in the news today uh, and will be, I, I'm sure, coming up in the future. Um, good news is average credit scores are up two points this year. Uh, so we're, we're seeing some improvement. They're up to 682 over 680 last year for the average Vantage score. So that's good. The other thing you might want to know, uh, gentlemen, we have some work to do. Women's scores on average are about four points better than men's. Uh, so I need to work on, on, uh, on that catching up. Um, T baby is back zero, zero. I'm sitting at 750, which I'm content with. What's the trick into getting into the 800 club? Um, probably keeping doing the, what you're doing, doing your, sounds like you're doing the right things and patience. Uh, it takes time, uh, and be lots of life will be a hundred years. You won't be a hundred years old. You might feel like you're a hundred years old in this 84. I don't. And if you are, congratulations. <laughs> I'm, uh, you, if you're, uh, so T baby is back at uh, double zero. If you're sitting at 750, moving in the right direction, that's a, a very good score. It's considered high prime. Uh, but if you uh, are just patient, keep those credit card balances low, keep making those payments on time, uh, you know, apply for credit only when you need it. Keep doing kind of the common sense stuff and your scores will improve over time. It's just a matter of building that history. Uh, scores go up and down, uh, you know, and eventually you'll hit that 800 number. There's no real secret. You only need, or I should say this, it's good to have one or two credit cards Make sure you use them periodically so that there's activity to be reported. So make a small purchase. Turn around the next day. Pay it in full. You don't have to carry a balance. There's no reason to. Uh, and that will help you make sure that those accounts are updated and that it shows activity. And over time, your scores will, will continue to improve. Uh, and you know, if you have high balances on cards, pay them down. The best way to know what to do quickly, and quickly is a relative term. There's nothing that's going to happen overnight. But... Uh, to make things happen as fast as possible. Get your credit report, get a credit score. Uh, and when you get that credit score, get the risk factors to go with it. They'll tell you exactly what from your credit report is most affecting those, that score. Focus on those factors. It might say reduce your credit card balances. Uh, it's ironic, even with really good scores. Um, and I've had the statement that I need to reduce my credit card balances. I pay them in full each month. If you use them, you have some balance. Uh, so I had very minimal balances, but that's what's having the biggest impact. And uh, so address those issues. So paying down balances always seems to help. Um, but work on those risk factors. You can also now, perhaps to give yourself a, a, a bit of a, a head start, think about using Experian Boost. And so if you go to Experian.com slash Boost, you can give us permission to access your bank account, your checking account or savings account that you pay, your utility bill through, your cell phone bill, and you can tell us what positive payments you want us to capture. And we'll each month be able to go in, capture that payment, bring it into your credit report. We'll include it as an account and it's positive information that could give you a boost to move you in uh, fairly quickly toward that score. Usually for people with scores around 750, that high, you're not going to see a big jump. You're already doing the right things. 
Um, but you might see a few points. You know, I've talked to people who, uh, one person in particular, said their score was close to 800, and they gained three, four points by adding their utility payments to their credit report. That's free. It's permission-based. If you don't want to do it, change your mind. You can tell us to stop, and we will. Uh, but that's something you might look into. Uh, again, that's at Experian.com slash boost. Um, so, but basically, it's it's all about being consistent and doing the same things over and over. It's, it's, it's credit scores. When you get down to the bottom of it, it it's kind of boring. <laughs> it's about making those payments on time, not applying for credit unless you need it. Now you're going to repay it. Uh, keeping your credit card balances as low as possible, paid in full. It's just being consistent um, and continuing to do the same things over and over and, and common sense kind of stuff. And you'll get there. Uh, I'm sure you will. Um, should you close the can? So uh, Lonnie123, uh, thanks for being here and certainly welcome to join. Um, Oblock900, thanks for joining. Uh, Lonnie123, should you close accounts? Does it make your score go down? So I actually talked to a, a reporter this morning about this. Is one of the, the myths that isn't but kind of is. So it's a little complicated. If you cl- and we're, I'm presuming we're talking about credit card accounts, so we call revolving accounts. If you close a credit card account, you will lose the available credit limit on that account. And as a result, something we call your utilization rate will go up. When the utilization rate increases, your scores will go down a little bit. Usually not very much, but they will go down a little bit. The utilization rate is a term we use. It's, it, the, another term for it is your balance to limit ratio. So it looks at all of the balances on your credit card. So if you add up all of your balances, and then it compares them to your available credit limit. So add up to get your utilization rate or your balance to limit ratio, add up all of the balances you have on all of your credit cards, and then add up all of the credit limits for those credit cards and divide the balances by the limits, you'll get a utilization rate or percentage. And the lower that utilization rate is, the better it is for your credit scores. Uh, So if you close a card, you lose some of that available limit, which makes the balances a bigger percentage of your then available credit. And as a result, your scores will dip a bit. Um, Usually, that's a temporary situation. Usually after two or three months, it will become clear that you didn't take on more debt. And that's what usually is the sign that that utilization rates are risk. You've taken on more credit card debt. And so that's a risk. If you close an account, after a few months, the scores figure out, oh, you closed an account. You didn't take on more debt. Those balances didn't go up on your individual cards, but your, your available credit limit went down. And the scores will start to rebound. Uh, so typically, you'll see those scores bounce back up after a few months, assuming everything else in the report stays the same and, and that your your uh, credit balances and things stay the same. So um, yes is the answer. If you close an account, uh, your scores will drop at first, but generally they come back up pretty quickly. Uh, the thing to think about if you're going to close an account or considering closing an account I wouldn't close it if you're planning to apply for a major credit purchase within the next few months. So if you're thinking about buying a car, buying a house, something else, leave it alone because you want those scores to be stable until you complete that process. So mortgages in particular, they can take several months to complete and they'll check your credit report and scores multiple times. So you don't want to make a change that's going to result in that score changing during that process. Better to wait till you have the keys in your hand, you're moving in. Uh, and you you completed that process, leave it alone in those cases. If on the other hand, you have an account, you're not planning on applying for credit, you don't use it, you don't want it, and there's nothing else that would require the use of a credit score, maybe close it. Um, The other thing I talk to people about is in some cases they have credit cards, um, they have one, say they, they max them out, they're struggling to make the payments they already have, they have an account with no balance, Uh, and they're tempted to use it when they're already maxed out on other cards or having trouble paying other bills. And the question is, should I close that account to remove that temptation Uh, because it could get them deeper into debt? And my response then is yes, uh, probably so. I mean, you have to look at your overall financial picture, especially if your scores are already struggling. Um, You Don't worry about the number. That's when this credit score doesn't matter anymore. It's about making sure you have control of your overall financial situation and looking to the future. So if your score's already low and it's going to go down a little bit more, 
who really cares if closing that account means you're going to keep yourself from getting deeper in debt and it can help you get back on your feet uh, and by taking away that temptation. So look at your overall situation too. It's not always just about the credit score. There are lots of other things to think about. You have to look at your overall financial picture when you make that decision. Uh, you know, I talk to people who are older and they have accounts, they're not going to use them um, and not applying for credit, they're retired, whatever it might be. And they ask if they should worry about their score. And it's like, well, your scores are in the 800s and you close that account and your score is going to go down 10 points or whatever it might be. And you're still going to be in the 800s. So why worry about it? You know, so it's that kind of situation too. So look at your situation and what your overall financial picture is and let that guide your decision. A score might be part of that decision, but it shouldn't be the only thing that's that's part of that decision. Your credit scores, I've seen people make bad decisions because they're so obsessed with the credit score that they make a poor decision for their overall financial health. We don't want that to happen either, uh, but you know, make sure that you uh, use that credit score as one of the tools in that decision, kind of like lenders do. Um, but make a good decision based on your overall financial situation. Don't get paralyzed by the number either. I worry about that because I talk to people when that happens. They're so worried about their credit scores that they make a poor uh, financial decision in light of their overall situation. So um, use the scores to your, your advantage, but don't don't let that be the only factor of the decision either. So you're not knowing about what are, what's going on and what other else might be going on. So um Ms. ZD4, can credit scores move more, especially during the holiday season, uh, like up or down? Well, they, they may move more during the holidays, but not because it's the holidays. Uh, it, you know, if scores are moving up and down, it's because you're using your credit more. You may be making more purchases, so your credit card balances are going up. You may be applying for new accounts to take advantage of discounts. So the holidays see a lot of activity in, in terms of credit. So that may cause scores to move around a bit, but just saying it's the holidays, so scores move, that's not the correlation. It has to be related to what you're doing with your credit history. So uh, some people may see their scores move. My scores have moved. I've made some additional purchases. Um, so I've used a bit more of my credit card uh, balances than I usually do. And so that's caused my scores to dip a bit. Uh, I don't worry about it because it's a natural thing. Scores go up and down all the time. I don't have perfect scores. Um, I've hit 850 a couple times and, and then it comes back down a bit and then goes back up. So, And that's kind of the way scores act. If you have a reason to use your accounts, your balances increase as compared to what they usually are, your scores might go down a little bit and then you pay them off, they go back up. So scores move up and down all the time. Um, holidays, because of the activity that people have, you might see more changes, but it's not because of the holidays. It's because of how people are using their credit during that season. Um, flag underscore Kenny. Thanks for joining. What do I think about credit cards that give you a credit score? Are they accurate? Yeah. I mean, Lonnie, one, two, three, they're typically FICO scores or Vantage scores. They're real scores and they provide them with your account statements in most cases. Uh, and, or, and so, or your billing statement each month. And they give you a sense of where you stand in terms of risk. They're typically scores that the lender will use. Um, you know, so they probably won't match. If you get a, get scores from different lenders, they'll probably look different. The numbers will probably be different simply because they're different scores or, or they're using a credit report from someone other than Experian. Uh, you know, so it could be TransUnion or Equifax as opposed to Experian. That can introduce a little bit of difference. But they'll probably all be similar. They're, they're perfectly legitimate scores. The thing that I always recommend is if you get a number, also get the risk factors that go with it. So the risk factors... The, term we use to describe the statements that explain what's affecting that score from your credit report. Because the number by itself is nice to know, gives you a sense of where you are in terms of risk. But you can't just change a number unless you know what's making that number what it is. So the risk factors tell you that. Get those risk factors if you're trying to work on that, that score and understand what you need to do because you have to change the information in your credit report in order for those scores to get better. And you need to know what information needs to be changed over time uh, that's affecting you specifically because they're all a bit different and everybody has a different credit history and the things that affect the scores there are, in some cases there's many 300 different factors that can affect the score um, and so you need to know what's one, which ones are affecting you uh, and so get those risk factors too if you can but yeah they're accurate um, Bay's back uh, you're very welcome that's why we're here uh, if you have questions 
others do too. And that's the whole idea. If I can help answer your questions, we're answering other people's questions too and helping more people learn and share. And that's, what's really important. Um, can so under, uh, I've recently given my debit card info into the Nigerian prince. Will we be able to use it in Nigeria? Uh, <laughs> Probably not a Nigerian prince, um, and it's a debit card, so it wouldn't affect your credit report. The debit card's tied to your checking account. They're not reported to experience, so your credit report's probably safe. Um, your bank account's probably in trouble, though, uh, so they may uh, take that out. Uh, don't collections have to prove accuracy and identity to keep an account on your report? Uh, so a collection agency, when they, you will be able to track the history of that account and that debt in your credit report. It will show the original lender. And it typically shows transferred to or sold to when an account is charged off and then it, and the name of that collection agency. And then you'll see the name of the new collection agency or the, the owner of that debt. And, that, and it will say transferred from or purchased from, acquired from, something like that. So you can track that history. Collection agencies become the legal owner of the debt. Um, you can dispute that information with experience. If you disagree, it's a debt you're not, you don't owe. The collection agency has a responsibility under federal law, under both the Fair Credit Reporting Act, as well as our policies to report accurate information. I'm sneeze, excuse me. Um, but they also have Fair Debt Collections Practices Act regulations and others to report that information accurately. If you have documentation that shows it's not your account, we can uh, we will dispute it. We'll share that information with them and and may be able to remove it or show that it's paid. We'll update the status, but they can report that account. Um, you know, so the, the, you know, the notion in credit repair is um, what they call a validation letter that would have to go to the, the, the collection agency doesn't really work the way people think they, they have an obligation. They own that debt um, and it can be reported um, a debt ratio. Exactly. Yeah. So uh, Lonnie, uh, Lonnie, one, two, three. Yes, I mean, the utilization rate, the, the balance to limit ratio or the debt ratio, but not debt to income. That's a different thing. Uh, and that sometimes gets confused. Uh, so when you're talking about debt to income ratio, that's something particularly mortgage lenders look at, but other lenders do as well when you're applying for a loan. Income is not part of a credit report. So we don't look at debt to income ratio. That's a calculation they, that the lender would do based on the income documentation you provide to them. Uh, and so different things. So don't confuse those two. It's a balance to limit ratio. So it's looking at your balance to limit on revolving credit accounts. So, uh, but I see that sometimes get confused. Um, and if you did share information with the Nigerian prince, uh, report potential identity theft. In all seriousness, uh, if you've had that happen and uh, you've been a, a victim of a phishing or smishing or you know, all the things that are going on these days, um, what we used to call pretext calling. Uh, if you, someone calls you on your phone and poses someone and gets your identifying information. In this case, check your credit report, make sure everything's okay. You can go to experian.com slash fraud and add what we call an initial security alert. It will last a year or until you take us, tell us to take it off. It says, I may be a victim. We'll give you a free credit report and you can make sure that everything's okay. In the meantime, anyone who asks for your report will get a notice that that uh, statements on file that you may be a victim and they need to respond to that. If you don't find anything that's an in indicator of fraud, you're probably okay. You can let that expire or ask us to take it off. If there are indications that you are a victim of identity theft and, and someone's trying to use your identity to commit financial crimes against you, or particularly credit fraud, you can file a police report and add a seven-year victim statement or extended fraud alert to your report that says, I am a victim, call me before granting credit my name. That will stay on the report. It's free, and lenders have to respond to those alerts, uh, and so that will help protect you. And in the meantime, if you have a police report, you can dispute information with us. We can, with a copy of that police report, begin to suppress or remove uh, the fraudulent information from the report proactively so we can restore that credit history and make sure everything's protected. So absolutely should do that. Um, and the Nigerian Prince thing, it's... it. it Sounds funny, but it's still true. A lot of people fall for for that scam. Uh, you know, I'm a Nigerian prince. If you put money in my account, I'll send you a million dollars. Well, the problem is you'll give them your money. They never send you that money. And you send them your identity, or your bank account numbers, and those sorts of things. And now they have your identity and information to steal your funds, whether it's uh, a bank account or other kinds of uh, financial crimes against you. So it is truly a serious problem. It sounds funny, but it's, it's very true. Uh, Ginkgo BC 899, thanks for joining. How do you get a fraud alert 
and security freeze off of your report. So if you go to experian.com slash fraud, um, one for fraud alerts, you'll find a link that tells you how to do that and, and it says, I need to remove the alert and you simply follow those processes. We may ask you to send us documentation verifying your identity because we want to make sure it's not a, a, a criminal fraudster who's trying to get that freeze lifted or that, or pardon me, that fraud alert lifted in order to commit fraud against you. So we'll verify your identity uh, with a freeze. You can go online to experian.com slash freeze. You can also call uh, and provide the pin number that you received when you place the freeze and we'll be able to lift the freeze and we can lift the freeze permanently. We can lift it for uh, any specified time uh, down to tw at a minimum of 24 hours. So uh, we can lift the freeze for as long as you'd like. You can take it off completely or you can tell us I want to to lift it for a couple of weeks while we're going through a, an application process, that sort of thing. Um, so that, but go to experian.com slash freeze for the freeze, go to experian.com slash fraud for the fraud alerts are two different things. Um, so, and, and shouldn't be any uh, challenge issue lifting them other than we want to verify your identity in the case of an alert to make sure it's you and not someone trying to commit fraud against you who's trying to get access to your report and shouldn't. Uh, so, that would be the only thing I'd you know, be sure that, that, that you're aware of. Um, how about increasing credit limits to help debt ratio? Won't that help your score and ratio? Uh, Lonnie, one, two, three. The, that's a common suggestion. The problem is that when you do that, other things happen too. So nothing in your report, um, or, or rephrase that, everything in your, your credit history is connected. So if you're going to increase your credit limit to try to offset your um, or re reduce your balance to limit ratio. Uh, in some cases, lenders will treat that as that request as an application for new credit. So that could be a hard inquiry that other lenders would see. So that could have an effect on your scores. There's a change now to your credit limit. It goes up. Uh, and because of that change, scores might shift a bit first and then and they might change. The bigger issue is that if you have a high balance to limit ratio, it's because you have high balances on your other credit cards. Uh, and so even getting a higher overall uh, um, credit limit increase uh, on one account doesn't necessarily overcome the high balances on individual accounts because credit scores look at overall balance. They also look at balances on individual accounts. So, you know, if you look at the risk factors that come with your credit report and it says balances on credit cards is too high, then the issue isn't just utilization rate, it's also individual accounts. So having one account increase the utilization rate or the uh, credit limit won't necessarily offset that. So it might not help at all. Uh, so, but when you pull a string, other things change and it won't always help. And generally, um, if you are trying to reduce your balance to limit ratio, it's better to pay down the debts you already have than to try to artificially add credit limits The other, it, because it's going to help faster and more permanently to pay down the balances that are existing on current accounts than it is to try to get a credit limit increase in order to offset those high balances. Um, so high balances on individual accounts is also important. The um, you know, other issue is, that, excuse me, is that... Um, and when you make those kinds of changes, um, you kind of lost my train of thought. There's, um, you know, you, you're, you're trying to change the utilization rate, got to reduce the balances. Utilization rate might not be the problem uh, on overall utilization. It might be individual accounts. So again, it's those factors. Um, so it might not help at all. Um, it might help a little bit, but generally it's about paying down the debt you already have. It's going to be more effective uh, in my experience. Um Scrolling down, um, hello from Turkey. Uh, I I can't speak to credit reporting and scoring in Turkey. It's completely different. Um, we might have some colleagues there. Experian actually has business operations in 40 countries around the world. You're, and I always tell people this. I'm in North America and our U.S. operations. Your U.S. credit report never leaves the United States. We never share credit histories and information across national boundaries. So even though we're a global company, your credit reports, if you live in the U.K., stay in the U.K., uh, so England, if, uh, if you are in the U.S., they stay in the U.S. So we have our current CEO has told this story that he moved from the U.K. to the U.S. and he had to start all over again because even though he works for Experian, he worked for Experian there and he moved here, 
his credit report didn't come with him. So uh, because they're just so they're different kinds of laws, different kinds of information that go into credit reports, different ways to identify people uh, and match those credit reports. So um, don't have to worry about that. But I can't speak to what the regulation rules and such are, are in Turkey. I just don't have that knowledge. Um, Akim and Jay, thanks for joining. Uh, absolutely feel free to, join, uh, to chime in if you have questions. I'm do my best to answer it. Little buddy, good to see you. Thanks for joining. Um, whoops, I just lost my questions. There we go. What's the... Okay, so, um, I'm trying to catch. I just scrolled down a little further. Um, uh, Randy D. Par uh, Paris. Why is it frowned upon to pay off a car loan three and a half years early in full? Um, it's not frowned upon by Experian or the credit reporting systems, maybe by the lender. Uh, if you have an auto loan, always understand the contract. They may have early payment um, penalties. Uh, so um, the re and because they're not getting paid all of the interest, so they're not making as much money, quite honestly, is generally the issue. Um, from a credit reporting standpoint, it would be reported as paid or paid in full, and that's a positive. So that should help you um, from a credit reporting scoring standpoint. So that should be good from our perspective. Um, Dom Meister, thanks for joining. Uh, where did the name Experian come from? Little buddy. Um, somebody's imagination. It doesn't stand for anything um, that I'm aware of, uh, and we've changed the logo over the years. Um, but it's, uh, it's, uh, doesn't stand for anything. Um, the only thing I always say is I wish they, and I joined about six months after the company be, became Experian or maybe a year. Uh, so I've been with Experian 22, going on 23 years. Uh, and there are times when I wish they would have chosen a name that didn't start with E because we have a competitor with a similar sounding name and that causes some confusion. Uh, so we are not Equifax, we're Experian, just to be clear. Uh, so, uh, but doesn't it, it, it's a marketing company's brand name, I guess. Um, no, no good story there. Um, be wisdom for life. Thanks for joining. Uh, uh, yeah, yeah, uh, Yemus. I'm, I'm sorry. I'm probably saying that wrong. I try to I do my best. Um, so my friend is about to have her car repoed. How much will that affect her credit? So if it's, it's probably already having a very serious impact because before a car is repossessed, you have to default on the auto loan, which means you didn't pay it as agreed. And so that's going to have a negative effect, probably pretty seriously. Uh, the repossession, the, the auto loan will then be reported as a repossession. Uh, so it depends on where you are with your credit scores and your credit history prior. Uh, if you And so, you know, it's hard to say how many points it, from a scoring perspective because there are so many different scores and different kinds of lending and in different scales so i would be wrong if i gave a number uh, so i've learned not to do that because i always have been caught when i said well here's the range i would guess at and then i'm they somebody say well it didn't happen to me that way um because there's so many different ones but the, the reality is it's going to have a very serious negative effect uh, probably going to make it difficult to qualify for new loans at least in the near term uh, or new credit um you know so it's going to be difficult the best thing to do is catch up on it if you can the other thing that your friend probably should be aware of is once that car is repossessed if the, the what the lender will do is sell it to try to recoup the loan amount that wasn't paid if they don't sell it for enough to cover that full loan amount if they forgive any remaining balance your friend will probably get what's called a 1099 form, which means they're treating that unpaid amount as income and you have to pay taxes on it. So be aware of that too um, as part of our federal tax system, um, which doesn't help, it kind of makes it even worse. But um, that's the reality. So be aware of those things. Uh, be wisdom for life. Does it make, Greedy, good to see you. Does it make sense to pay on an account in collections that's three years old? Yes, for this reason. Uh, a paid collection account will have less effect on your credit scores and credit history than an unpaid account. So it's going to help in terms of improving your scores faster. A paid collection with the newest scores like Vantage Score 3.0 or 4.0 or uh, FICO 8 or FICO 9, and FICO 8 is the most commonly used score now, a paid collection it doesn't count against the score anymore. So they exclude it from the calculation. So if you can pay a collection, even if it's three years old, it can help your scores right away. 
so it always makes sense to pay that collection if you can. Um, so be aware of that. So reported is paid uh, and zero balance is going to help those scores. Uh, what's the best way to manage your credit coming out of high school? Trill T, what a great question. Uh, and starting early is really important. If you're coming out of high school, you may not have a credit history. Uh, and let, you don't have a credit history unless you've opened an account in your name uh, and have an account reported. So the credit history has to exist. Uh, that's the first thing. And then you start small. You know, always a good idea. You might open a secured account if you don't have an account already. It means you have a savings account with a credit card account tied to it. So that if you charge with the card and don't pay the bank, they can take the money out of your uh, savings account. So the secured, the word secured applies to the bank, not to you. It's securing them uh, from you not paying the bill. So, but a secured account can be a great way to start a credit history because you establish savings and you start to build that credit history as well. Um, just make small purchases, pay it in full, uh, and then keep your balances as low as possible. Understand that credit is a financial tool. Debt's a financial problem. You want to not don't use credit to buy stuff you want with that and stop thinking about it there. Think about if you're going to use credit, anytime you pull out that credit card, think about why am I making this purchase with credit? When will I pay it back? How will I pay it back? And what date specifically? So make it very specific. And what am I going to have to give up if I buy this thing with credit that I otherwise would get uh, if I if I were using cash because using credit is always a trade off. You know, you're taking on debt, which means you need to repay that debt, and so you're going to have to delay in order to manage that debt. Delay a purchase or not purchase something else that you want. So think about it in those terms, and use credit to get points or cash back or tools like that that help you financially. But keep track of that credit report. Check the credit report annually. Same advice I would give to anybody at any point in life. Know what's in that credit report. Make sure that it's being reported accurately. Most of it, the time it is. Our credit reports are extremely accurate. Um, not perfect, but and we're working on it. We want you to be part of that process. Uh, and so check that report. Know what's there. Use credit as a financial tool. Uh, don't use it to just buy stuff you want. That's what will get you in trouble. Make sure you know why you're buying it. Make sure you know when you're going to pay it off and give yourself a specific date. Know how you're going to pay it off and know what you're going to give up until you get it paid off. So um, that's kind of the, the process I've always followed too, is try to, uh, after I learned that lesson. Uh, so, and I learned it the hard way. So um, that's my advice, uh, you know, as, as you're going through life. But glad to see you're starting already thinking about it, sorry, that's fantastic. Um, just got your score to 710. Does this mean anything if I want to buy a house? Mr. Foods, uh, yes. I mean, the higher your score, the lower the rates you'll qualify for in terms of interest. That's always good. Uh, so make sure that you continue to do what you're doing as your scores are going up. It's, it's going to help. If you're going to buy a house, get pre-qualified. Um, and that way you'll know kind of how much you'll qualify for and what it will cost. Uh, and then get pre-approved, which means they'll go through the whole process. I tell you, this is the check we'll cut for you. Uh, you know, pre-qualified means they give you a sense of what you qualify for. Pre-approved means that they've approved you for that purchase um, and you'll know exactly what the bank would give you, but uh, don't be afraid to shop around. That doesn't hurt your scores to look for the best rates for mortgage loans at all. So make sure you do that. Um, so it can help you. Uh, the, the better scores, the more it will help. Uh, me from purchase a home. I missed the first part of the question, I think. Um, but you need to have a credit history uh, and, and credit scores, the better they are, the lower the terms that could save you a lot of money. So, uh, that's what's really important. And this is live. Uh, and if you're just joining, I've been rambling. I'm Rod Griffin. I'm Director of Consumer Education and Advocacy for Experian. One of the best known as one of the big, big three national credit reporting companies. I try to be here uh, Tuesdays and Thursdays, 1.30 Central, 2.30 Eastern for about 30 minutes. I'm looking at the clock. I'm running a little long. A lot of great questions today. Um, and I think the sound's working. Other people are saying it's it's been okay. Uh, I hope it is. Uh, and um, I try to be here to answer your questions. That's what it's all about is, is to help you get answers to the questions you have about what we do at Experian, your credit reports, credit scores, and so on. Fraud and ID theft, how to get help, all of those sorts of things because we want you to use a credit report as a financial tool. It shouldn't be a mystery and your credit reports and scores should be tools that you can use to walk into a lender or to apply for an apartment or to set up your utility service and know what to expect from the minute you walk in the door. Uh, and, and that's what we want to have happen. We don't want it to be a mystery. We want it to be a tool you can use to get the services you need at the rates you want to pay. 
in the best terms. We want to help facilitate that, re that relationship. Are credit cards necessary? Can you build good credit without them? Uh, little buddy, they're not absolutely necessary. You can have a good credit history without having credit cards, or, um, but we recommend you have one or maybe two. You don't need a lot, just one or two. Make a small purchase every month, pay it in full, some $10, $20, turn around and pay it right away. That way you have a revolving account. Credit cards are unique in that you decide how much you're going to charge each month. You decide how much you're going to pay each month. So you can max out the card. You can only purchase, you only charge a little bit. You can pay the balance in full each month or just a minimum due or somewhere in between. That kind of what I think of as free will and the way you manage that account and those debts gives a little better insight into how you will manage other kinds of, of credit relationships. And so it can help your scores improve a bit faster. Not absolutely necessary, but helpful to have one or two accounts. Uh, can you say something on credit frauds these days happening all around? Oh, man, there are, uh, Merzinia, there are lots of things to be careful about, aware of in terms of credit fraud. There are data breaches that we really, uh, as you and I as consumers, can't control, but you need to be aware of. If uh, you get a notice of a breach, follow the instructions they provide. Make sure you're protecting yourself. If they offer monitoring services for free, take advantage of them um, so that you're making sure that your identity is protected. Um when you're making purchases this time of year in particular, if you're shopping for the holidays, there are lots of things that happen that are just kind of common sense. If you're uh, out shopping at a retail store, at the mall or downtown, don't leave your identifying information like a purse or a wallet with your uh, driver's license and other information on the seat of the car when you go in. I, I hear that happen a lot uh, or documentation sitting in the glove box because thieves will break windows and steal that information to commit fraud. Uh, if you're standing in line and giving someone your credit card or applying for instant credit, make sure you check over your shoulder because somebody can stand there with that phone right over your shoulder and, and film what you do so they can capture your credit card, number, name, PIN number, um, password, all of that, and they're off to the races. So be cautious about what's going on around you and the information you share. If someone asks for information and you don't know why, make sure you understand where they need it. So if they ask for your social security number, say, why do you need that uh, if I'm applying for credit? You shouldn't, you know, maybe you do, maybe you don't. Um, so be aware of, of those sorts of things. Um, just So it's about an abundance of caution. If you get information, billing statements, those sorts of things, make sure you shred them before you put them in, the trash, because that's still a favorite way for identity thieves to steal information, believe it or not. Um, we were talking earlier about the Nigerian scam. So if you get a, an email you don't recognize, it sounds like it's a, a business that you want to do business with. If it's your bank saying, hey, there might be a problem, you need to give us your account number, that is not your bank. Your bank will never ask for your account number or PIN number or password. They already know that stuff. So if you get something that looks like it's from your bank or your credit union, uh, and they're asking for that kind of information, it's not them. Get your credit card out and find the customer service number on the back of it or your billing statement. Call that number or go into a branch and ask them to make sure that you're working with them. If they've asked for that information, know exactly what they need. Uh, really important. Uh, so a lot of things, kind of basic stuff. Um, debit or credit, which should be more preferred? Well, from a, it depends on how you use them. A debit card is basically... A cash transaction. It's a plastic card, looks like a credit card, but when you use it, it accesses your checking account. So it's not reported to the credit reporting companies. Uh, doesn't affect credit scores in any way. So if you're using a credit card, that's going to be reported to Experian. They have advantages as well. If it's being a fraud and tying those two together, if you're using, if you're shopping online, I would recommend using a credit card. And often shopping when I'm out during the holidays, I'll use a credit card. Because if that number is stolen, you're protected by federal law uh, and, and often state laws that limit your liability. So it, it, if someone uses that card, steals that card number, it's a credit card. You're limited to $50 um, liability as a result of the fraud. Most lenders waive them. Debit cards don't have that express, what we call express or specific protection. So a debit card can be a bit more risky. Um, you know, so it really depends on how you're using it. I, you know, we, we use both. If I make a cash transaction, I'll use a debit card. Um, if I'm 
making other purchases. This time of year, I use credit cards a lot. If I'm traveling, I use a credit card for the same reason. It gives me additional protections. That makes me safer. Uh, also gives me benefits. So airline miles or cash back or those kinds of rewards. So keep that in mind as well. Don't weigh the differences. It, it just it depends. That's kind of the answer to everything. Can collectors collect from your Social Security payments? Uh, that also depends on the collector and the bill. I'm not an expert in those laws. There's a Fair Debt Collections Practices Act. Someone else would probably be able to better answer that, but they may be able to garnish wages and do some other things. So good question for the IRS. Uh, their website may be able to provide some good information. Uh, how to secure from credit frauds. And that's difficult. It's uh, one about being thoughtful about how you're using your accounts, uh, making sure that you're working with legitimate businesses. When you're shopping online, make sure you know who you're working with, that it's a legitimate business, that you've done your research if you and that you know the name of the company or the business, you're familiar with them. Uh, always important. That can, can help a lot. Uh, so um, be cautious. Uh, you know, I, I'll share the story of my daughters who wanted to buy each other and the ladies may know more about this than men but coach purses and they went online and they found this really great deal for coach purses and they ordered them a few years ago and they got the coach purses and it turns out they weren't co coach purses they were they were counterfeit and they were from an overseas company and they went through a lot trying to get their money back and um, actually got coach involved and they helped and it was you know so they ended up coming out okay but if something sounds too good to be true, probably is. Um, and so they went back and actually bought coach purses for each other. Uh, so, and, and from a reliable source, um, cost a bit more, but it was worth worthwhile. Uh, so, um, you know, really important. Um, the Tony Montana nine, uh, you were at a Costa Mesa office. Cool. Yeah. I get there. I usually get there several times a year. Uh, so, and I'm, I'm based in our Allen, Texas office. Uh, and, uh, <clears throat> excuse me, starting to lose my voice, but, uh, I am, t I'm part of the, the corporate communications team that's based in Costa Mesa. So I get out there quite often. Um, you hear about evil corp. No, don't know about, don't know about them. Uh, social security benefits collectible that I'm not sure, um, that, uh, and I'm not sure exactly what the question is. That's a better question for the IRS. Um, Nate from Sunnyvale. Good to see you. Yeah. Nearby. Um, and, uh, always good to see, hear from another Texan. Uh, and I think we've reached sort of the end. I've been a little long, a lot of fantastic questions today. Thank you for being part of the chat again. I'm Rod Griffin. If you're just joining, I'm about to sign off, but I'm Rod Griffin, director of consumer education and advocacy for Experian. This is credit chat. I try to be here one thirty central two thirty Eastern on Periscope to answer your questions about credit reporting, identity theft, credit scores, all of those kinds of things. We're on Twitter, 2 o'clock Wednesdays, uh, uh, Central, 3 p.m. Eastern. And we're going to talk about New Year's resolutions for credit tomorrow. So hope to see you there. I'm not going to be able to make it Thursday unless plans change, but I'm, I'll be uh, um, on the road traveling. So I'm sorry I won't be able to see you then. But I hope to be back in, in a couple of weeks and, and see you there. Um, oh, so much money. I need help. And talk to the National Foundation for Credit Counseling. Uh, quick, one more point I would recommend a great place, uh, organizations around the country, nonprofit that can help you look at your finances, help work with your lenders if they need to and do all sorts of things to help. So nfcc.org that can, you can find a member organization in your community, uh, city in your area. So nfcc.org, uh, for, uh, that question. Um, so actually my name is Marcus. I'm s sorry. You're just joining again. I'm signing off. Thank you all for being here. Hope you all have a wonderful holiday season, and I will talk to you all again very soon. Take care, everybody.